members for today's session. Today, the workshop session is targeted on online gaming addiction. And we have uh, wonderful speakers with us today. So uh, I would like to welcome Raman Nagpal, sir. He's an eminent computer scientist, social entrepreneur, and co corporate executive. Sir holds a bachelor in computer science from Delhi Institute of Technology and a master's in computer science from Bits Pilani. He's an MBA and a chartered financial analyst. He's also a certified corporate director from INSEED Business School. He was on board of Adobe India and Mokrea Global Alliance. He has over 25 years of experience of running global businesses, large enterprises, as well as his own startups. He has more than eight years of public fund management experience and more than 20 years of investing business experience. As founder and CIO of Acura Cap, he has launched 3 billion PMS AIF funds since 2011, totaling an investment of over rupees 11 billion. Welcome, sir. I would also welcome Madam Deepa. She's with us for yet another session. She's a self-directed, motivational, and action-oriented professional with more than seven years of experience in education sector and has served as a school mentor in Red Hill School and Loreto Convent School, Lucknow. She has also been a motivational speaker in a number of schools like DPS, Queen's Convent, JP International, Abhinav Public School, Udgam School, and many more, and has taken workshops on good touch, bad touch, anger management, and anti-bullying, committed to creating an atmosphere that is inspiring and promising for a child. Welcome, ma'am. Welcome once again. So I hand over the mic to you, Deepa ji. Please begin today's session. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Um, okay, so I believe uh, that online gaming is becoming more and more of a problem with this uh, pandemic, I believe or most of the students and maybe the elders have also got addicted to this online gaming and the social media addiction as well. So uh, Raman sir, first and foremost, I would really love to ask that uh, actually this online gaming along with this pandemic has uh, you know killed the motivation of the students and maybe all of us of you know just going outdoor and enjoying the outdoor activities and actually it is killing the playground so what is your uh, opinion about it yeah uh, so thanks um, vatsala and thanks deepa for the, the introduction and for having me here and uh, i would like to um, to welcome all the attendees today very pleased to be able to share my views with the next generation it's always very uh, energizing to do so uh, specifically to to your question deepa um, before we we go into the 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 negative aspects of uh, the online gaming some of which you alluded to i was thinking about the the topic of the session today right as it says online gaming addiction and i think um, as always, I like to take a holistic view, right? I mean, things usually don't come in absolutes. They don't come in only shades of good or shades of bad. It's usually a mixed battle. Some may be better than others, but there are always some silver linings, even in the, the, the darkest clouds, right? So I think one needs to probably go a little deeper to understand what this beast is about, right? What, what this whole online gaming addiction is about and how it is impacting us as individuals, as families, as societies, as countries, as economies, there are so many aspects to it, right? And so to give you a really long, long answer to a short question, I would say, let's start from the start, right? Let's try and understand what addiction really means, right? And how does it apply to online gaming? Okay. To my mind, addiction in general um, is always associated with the activities happening in the brain, right? And usually these activities are got to do with either pleasure or pain or both. As you know, all the emotions in our mind are a function of chemicals, of hormones and neurotransmitters that are flowing, right? In human body, if you focus on a handful of those chemicals or those hormones, uh, the four prominent ones that deal with pleasure and pain in the brain specifically would be serotonin, oxytocin, dopamine and endorphins right 
I'm sure some of you are very familiar with this, but basically dopamine is the one which is usually associated with addiction. Uh, and that's why any kind of addiction or any kind of drug, for example, may be called dope. That's coming from dopamine. Dopamine is, which is the chemical which reinforces the, the, the pleasure sensations in the mind, in the brain, and therefore reinforces the need to do something or to consume something. Now, if you look at the other three, right, they also play a very important role. Oxytocin, for example, right? Oxytocin, think of it as, as they call in casually, the, the hugging hormone, right? The, this is the one which um, promotes bonding, which promotes love, which promotes affection. This is the, the, the chemical that is released every time you interact with someone you like or love, right? This is the chemical which bonds a, a mother to a newborn baby. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful chemistry that's going on in our brain all the time without us realizing it. And then, of course, there's serotonin, which is this general well-being chemical, right? Uh, responsible for all kinds of feeling well and happy and content. And any decrease in that would cause problems such as depression. And finally, endorphins, which are more sort of the pain-relieving chemicals, right? Every time you are under physical stress, let's say you worked out a lot, um, the body releases these chemicals and, and that's why they call you feel a runner's high. If you ran long, a marathon, they feel high, they get addicted to it because endorphins are very strong. They are 100 times stronger than, an, let's say, a typical painkiller tablet, right? So, so you start to get addicted to that. So there are these different chemicals responsible for different addictions. If you look at the online gaming, it mainly plays to your dopamine of course, it doesn't play to your endorphins. You can tire your hands, but not as much where the body will start releasing endorphins, right? So mainly it plays to your dopamine and it plays to some extent to your oxytocin. If you are indulging in social games, right? Uh, games which involve playing with other friends or interacting to some extent, social media, right? Social messaging, whether it's Facebook, whether it's other means to connect to your friends and family, that's also promoting oxytocin. And so it's this heady combination predominantly of dopamine and to some extent of oxytocin, which is causing the so-called online gaming addiction, right? So to some extent, every game maker's incentive is to maximize the stickiness of their game. It is to, to, to make every user try and spend as much time on their platform as possible because money comes from how, much, how many and how much longer those users stay to their platform, right? So they are in some sense trying to play with these chemicals in your mind. And the more they can associate the feeling of games with those chemicals, the more money they make. It's as simple as that, right? Now, <clears throat> there is another aspect to it. And that's why I, I sort of am a little conservative in using the word addiction with online gaming. So I was reading a statistic uh, uh, and, and a very interesting incident that happened in Canada, I think a few months ago where a few parents sued the company behind Fortnite. Fortnite, as some of you may know, is a very popular game amongst uh, teenagers, uh, adolescents, even some adults perhaps, right? It's a very, very addictive game, okay? And the parents who sued the company behind Fortnite, they did so because they said their kids had spent more than 2,000 hours of game in a year on playing these games, right? Which had spoiled their academic performance, which had spoiled their health, they had become obese. Now, you can sympathize with these parents, with these kids, but then you have to actually ask something deeper, right? Which is 2000 hours per year, quick calculation, more than five and a half hours per day, every single day of that week, 52 weeks a year, right? So the question to ask is, is this the gaming, gaming company's fault? Is this the kid's fault or is this the parent's fault? Who are these parents who would quietly and silently allow their kids to play five and a half hours every day of game, provide them those smartphones, provide them high speed network and let them spend five and a half hours every day on this game and then one year later sue the company, right? By calling it addiction, what we do is we also tend to take away responsibility from our own selves, whether as parents or as kids, right? We tend to think that this is a helplessness situation, that these chemicals are in the about. 
statistics show that of all the people that we claim are addicted to gaming, maybe only 5%, 6% globally are truly clinically diagnosed as, as suffering from addiction or gaming disorder, right? Which is probably what a lot of literature is on. Whereas the remaining 94, 95%, that's not really addiction. That's like any other pleasurable activity, right? So, so for example, if I like reading books, right? Chances are when I read books, I'll have a flow of dopamine in my brain. Now, does that mean book is a bad thing or that I'm addicted to books? Perhaps I'm not. When I eat food, and maybe something that I like, I would still have flow of chemicals in my brain. So does that mean food is bad? Not necessarily bad, right? So I guess when we use the word addiction, we have to be a little careful because by saying addiction, we, we seem to take away all the responsibility and put the onus on, on the gaming or the game making companies, right? I think somewhere we have to understand that it is like any other pleasurable activity, right? And therefore, not necessarily addiction. Somewhere with discipline, with control, it would not be addiction. It would be like any other pleasurable activity. And as we know, excess of any activity is bad. So I think that's sort of the holistic view to take as a society. Yeah, very true, sir. Very true. So like, as you said that uh, everybody is not addicted, only 5 to 10% are addicted. So like, what are the signs a person should, uh, you know, identify himself that I am slowly getting, you know, it's not just normal for me, but I am slowly and steadily getting addicted to that game or maybe... I think um, it's fairly commonsensical, though the, the person who gets addicted for them, it may not be easy, right? Because as, as, as a joke goes, hey, I've been smoking every day for the last 10 years, but, I, but I'm still not addicted. Now, what does that even mean, right? Um, the point is, if you tend to think a little objectively, step back from whatever habit you consider as addiction, and start to make a simple list of things which are very important in your life okay so let's say for someone spending time with their parents their friends uh, their family may be very high priority for someone it may be about their job for students in this case most audience are probably students it may be you know uh, furthering their their academic progress and sort of let's say getting um getting a job in a dream company or getting admission in let's say you know mit i don't know what all high priority stuff there might be for different people but i guess what i'm saying is one simple test of whether you are addicted is to say put that high priority thing that you would really love to do or dream of on one side of the balance and this habit on the other and say if i have to give up one for the other am i willing to do it Usually, if you are true to yourself and say, I'm not able to give up this game, even realizing fully well that this is going to impact my goals on the academics, because for me, that was the, 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 the most important thing, then I think there is an addiction. There is something wrong with you giving up everything that's important to you for this game or this addiction, right? On the other hand, if you are actually able to maybe you've gone temporarily out of something very important for this and to me i think i've seen people you know kick out their old habits of smoking or other kinds of habits in a snap right usually all this support that we talk about that people need to you know get out bad habits etc in most cases my experience get off and move on and that there's something more important than that addiction usually things are out of course whatever support help is needed is needed i'm not saying that Everyone can do it themselves. Of course, there are people who are deeply addicted, who are clinically addicted, and they do need medical help, counseling, etc. Yeah, very true. Absolutely, sir. So one more thing I wanted to ask you, sir, that the youth of today, they are enjoying these games and, you know, because, uh, you know, more they feel comfortable. 
they feel socially or isolated they don't have to uh, do have to face that face to face competition there is no peer pressure because mostly i believe they play games with unknown people like they are just socially connected and playing with people whom they hardly know so if they lose or win they have nothing to lose they don't have to face anybody so this gets them into that loop no that's a that's a very uh, good observation uh, deepa i would again add multiple aspects or dimensions to that observation uh, what online gaming does is introduce a layer of anonymity as you said and that anonymity has side effects both positive and negative uh, a very simple way to look at this is look at the kind of language that's being used on twitter or on instagram or on facebook right amongst let's say a celebrity and their fans a cricketer and their fans uh, a movie star and their fans okay there are there is such abusive behavior that certain fans or whoever they are show right now without getting judgmental about it the question to ask is if these same people were standing in front of the celebrity in an in person situation would they have the courage to say those words a, a 12 year old or a 14 year old abusing a 60 year old respected uh, let's say a corporate executive it's very easy to do right but do you think the same 12 year old standing in front of this guy or in front of let's say the press or amongst their own family be able to say those words they won't right so therefore the moment you get anonymity your behavior changes and it works both ways right you become more vocal you 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 the choice of words the kind of emotions that come out are different but then that also works the other way where the other person when interacting with you may do uh, things that he wouldn't otherwise do in person he may say things that he wouldn't do otherwise in person right so a person who is getting bullied right physically in school amongst their friends at least he has an escape route he can come back home and avoid that bullying he can he can avoid meeting those people right but when you are on the internet right you could be getting bullied while you are sitting in the comfort of your home surrounded by your family and your parents and you can't do anything about it uh, you could be getting bullied by people you you don't know you have no idea right and you could be bullying people who you don't even know personally even the kind of friendships and relationships that these online presence establish are qualitatively very different than the in person ones right now there's a lot of research that's happening in this area right because the the bonding that happens between two persons as i explained earlier usually there there are there's a there's a neurotransmitter and chemical chemistry involved there right so there's a flow of oxytocin which makes you feel you like a person right but how does that trigger happen right uh, a lot of senses in your body are involved in creating situation that leads to bonding right and you you are sort of seeing the person you're hearing them there's a smell in the background there there's there, there's other kind of perception about the person about their uh, body language which is make, making you feel them as being a friendly person or an offensive person and so on and so forth now when you're interacting with the same people over internet sometimes you have a video feed sometimes you just have textual feed right sometimes you have a voice feed sometimes you don't and so therefore only a subset of your sensory perceptions and organs are in the play now i don't think enough research has been done to suggest or to to figure out what that does to your feelings or your feelings of bonding with the other person right maybe you do form so called friends on facebook right hundreds of them something that you are unlikely to form in person but then the quality of that relationship is that superficial is that deep right and we may think of it very tactically but i am saying there are probably deeper technology and chemistry issues involved here right falling in love with someone over internet versus falling in love with someone in person are two completely different things because the, the the senses that are involved are very different so would the quality of the relationship the degree of the affection the depth of it the significance of it be the same be different you don't know okay and so to that extent of course what that means is uh, 
it's changing the family it's changing the relationship so if you if you think about it it's it's not just about the the effect that people have they may be getting depressed etc right so there's a physical implication to it which we can talk a little bit more about right there's a mental implication of it in terms of your cognitive and and learning skills which get impacted by spending too much time and and there's research that's been done to demonstrate that there's the emotional part of it right which is some of you know people becoming irritable or depressed there's a familial and um, a societal part of it which is is the society starting to become more superficial uh, do people know a lot more people today but they really don't know them unlike earlier where you only knew 10 but you knew them well right and then there is an economic cost of all these activities right think of those five and a half hours that that kid or that student or that even a working guy is spending on the the gaming platform or on the social platform those five and a half hours were worth something there was probably some economic activity there was something probably academically that the student could have done better right by the way i'm not suggesting that students should not have fun they shouldn't have social relationships all i'm saying is is there a balance is there a prioritization there's a cost to everything right so there's always a cost benefit implication that one needs to think about right so so and then there's of course the the, the overall um health issue right as a society as individuals as families especially in the context of india with a i would say still a fairly poor public health system right uh, we are already the diabetes capital of the world right when it comes to cardiac issues we are right there number one with our population and with our pretty mediocre health care and awareness you can very well imagine what's going to happen to people who are sitting on their terminals for 5 hours 10 hours i see so much obesity today right simple evidence uh, i encourage all the students here in this call to go back and look at maybe some of the videos from the old archives look at the the, the let's say you'll probably find some old videos over youtube showing you know the times of let's say the freedom struggle right 1940s and 50s the old videos right just just take a look there and look at the 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 population the people look at how what was their frame size how thin they were right and look at the average size of a person sitting today next to you okay there is such a huge change right in in how indians look 40 years ago and how they look today now of course some of it is positive where people have with better nutrition better awareness better exercise become better but then also look at the the bmi look at the weight right look at the 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 the, the obesity that's really hitting us and we don't realize that you know how bad this is going to get in the next 10 20 years as the first generation that went through that transition is going to get into their you know 50s and 60s okay so there's of course the, the whole societal issue of it the health issues the 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 mental issues the physical issues i mean there are so many implications of each one of these that one needs to think about of course when we are getting that pleasure from the games we forget all about it and the dopamine takes over okay. i know okay matsala ma'am anything you would like to ask you can please add on um, Uh, you know sometimes i feel that uh, the young kids like when we were young we used to go out play in the streets but you know kids today they uh, are far from away from those games so do you believe sir that all of these things this online gaming addiction and things that, uh, like that the social media is it leading towards you know uh, becoming our kids more uh, introverted and you know what should we do to you know push them out of homes and you know go out and play with other kids of their own age yeah so <clears throat> i would say in general the the generation today is much smarter than perhaps our generation there there's no doubt about that right now that's got to do with more exposure better nutrition and natural evolution process where you know subsequent generations hopefully keep getting better but what is also true is that there is a whole breed of gamers who never stepped out of their homes and actually experience physical activity okay now maybe some benefits of gaming um, that one would have looked at the traditional sports for are there 
the the feeling of competitiveness is also important for survival right your your need to compete and succeed and win over and you know that you 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 can't sort of have people say you you shouldn't compete at all because that's not great for society either that said there are some very natural experiences that a person needs to have the 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 feeling i mean sports is a great teacher sports is a builder of character right in 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 sort of especially sports where you have some physical contact soccer right or to some extent even cricket uh, which is which are probably the two most popular sports in india and then maybe hockey and uh, others tennis to some extent what you find is that there is an element of physical contact there is an element of um, feeling defeated physically and and having to gracefully accept it in front of everyone right now when it comes to online gaming a lot of that physical contact simply goes away and this feeling of winning and losing remains but then you tend to create your own bubble where let's say people you are losing to constantly you start to move from there and go into either a different arena or play with players where you feel you know you're winning more etc it's very easy to do it virtually in a physical world you can't keep choosing and changing your team or sports partners very quickly right so that that ability to establish long term contacts the ability to accept winning and losing as a part of the game to do it gracefully and then to come tomorrow again and play with the same guy who defeated you yesterday becomes you know teaches you something that online experience doesn't now of course there are people who probably play every day maybe lose most days and then continue to play well great but i'm saying the probability of learning some of those leadership and practical skills are a much higher in the physical world than in the online of course there are benefits to to gaming as well that one needs to point out there are games which stimulate your ability to think your ability to logically analyze your reflexes right uh, your long term and short term memory in fact there's a lot of been a lot of research that's been done especially how people as they get older right rather than idling if they are exposed to certain kinds of online games right can actually help slow down let's say their alzheimers or mental dementia there are games uh, that claim and again some of the, those companies were sued you might be familiar with a company called lumosity which um, uh, promoted some very interesting games in fact i i tested all their games uh, just to see and i thought some of those games were very good and i i strongly recommend that students at least play some of those games um the 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 ability to stimulate a particular characteristic and and each game designed to do a particular aspect of it whether spatial uh, awareness or ability to multitask to memorize things in a particular order i thought those were very useful for students there there's one difference that i find in those kind of games and the 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 fortnite and the world of warcraft and you know league of legends etc which is as i explained earlier gaming is big business just to just to give you some sense right and i think uh, the the students here today would be very interested because uh, these are the these are the days of startups and you know as budding engineering students people would be very um, i'm assuming would very, would love to work in some of these startups okay so so let me give you a sense of the the gaming world here any idea what is the global revenue of the gaming industry okay uh today it is about 70 billion dollars okay um from 70 to 200 billion in 2023 is the expected projection so gaming industry will be a 200 billion dollar industry in 2023 okay just to understand how significant and big this is let's compare this to india's largest companies just to understand how big this is okay india's largest company by revenue today is reliance no surprises here right from oil refining to everything right from telecom to what not right it's all reliance reliance is not even one third of that revenue today okay you add two more so three largest companies in india would be reliance by revenue reliance ongc and indian oil so think of the indian population think of the amount of petroleum that we petroleum products that we consume you would find an indian oil petrol pump everywhere in india 
you would find ONGC taking hold of all the oil resources in India. And then, of course, Reliance, which is a global refinery for the world, other than, of course, their venture into telecom. If you combine the revenues of the three biggest companies in India, their revenue adds up to a little less than what the gaming players in the world are going to be making. So that's the industry. And so you can imagine the kind of forces behind that revenue and what they would not do to make their business successful. Okay. So each of these games are specifically designed to play to that biochemistry in the mind and to make it as addictive as possible. If you look at Facebook, Facebook's market value, anyone here in the forum, probably some of you do uh, know what it is. It's usually in, in the $800 billion mark plus minus based on what news is coming, right? Bigger than any company, significantly bigger than any, any meaningful company in India would ever be. Okay. They again playing to the same thing. How do they make money? They only make money by making you addicted to the social media, right? The more time you spend, the more people you network with, the more ads they can show you, the more money they make and the higher their uh, market cap. So what one has to understand is these are tools. But tool makers have not made them with the purpose of making it useful for you. They've made them for the purpose of maximizing their revenue. So they are not going to worry too much about whether the tools eventually going to be in your benefit or is going to harm you or harm your family time, right? Harm your relationship with your family or harm your physical health or harm your mental health or your psychology. They're only going to worry about how much money they can make all this uh, brohaha about WhatsApp privacy, as you understand, it's nothing but um, Facebook has least interest in invading your privacy. Let me be the first person to say that. Okay, it's not really about privacy. They just want to use that data to monetize it on Facebook, right? That's all they want. So if they could show ads, ads, more ads, more relevant ads, that's what all they care about, right? They really don't care about your your private secrets. And I guess what I'm saying is, therefore understanding how big this industry is and how much money gets made out by you and me going out on the internet and sort of playing those games and posting on social media that one needs to be a little bit wary and understand what forces we are working against right so as users we feel pretty happy about posting messages connecting with our friends playing games and nothing of that is bad by the way done in moderation i feel it's great okay but be very aware and be very cynical of anything that is being offered for free. As they say, if something, some service or product is free, then usually you are the product. You are being sold. Okay. So therefore, be very careful when getting to any of these forums. They are specifically designed to, to extract and pull out as much time from your other activities onto their platform so that they can make money off your time. So in a way, by using these platforms, you're working for them. You are, you're spending your time and they're making money. So at least be aware of it. As long as it's pleasurable, as long as it's not coming, coming at the cost of something else important in your life. As I said, always balance that. Always question the time that I'm spending here, the four hours, the three hours. Is there something that I'm giving up for that? Well, if you're not giving up anything, well, great. All the best. Keep doing this. Okay, but always have that balance, that perspective in mind. Also, I believe time management is very, very important. They have to manage their time between playing and their extra or their activities, which they have to, you know, adhere to. Okay, so, sir, one more thing I would also like to ask that uh, playing with the playing these online games, the youth of today actually believe that uh, you know. Since there's a lot of killing and, you know, just defeating the other person whom you're playing the game with, uh, I believe they think that violence in real life also has become normal. It's, it's normal to abuse someone. It's normal, you know, and especially the movies and on social media, violence, uh, they have just portrayed it to be a very, very normal situation. So what's your view about it? Yeah, again, uh, you know, this, this same... If, if you think about it, uh, uh, some of the same issues have, have been raised against movies in the past, right? Uh, against uh, television programs, right? Showing too much violence or showing too much nudity or, you know, obscenity, etc. Uh, so I think it's again a mixed bag, right? Uh, 
there's always this debate about uh, is this virtual world really mimicking what's already there in the real world and, and therefore they're not doing anything wrong with it or is it that what they are doing tends to influence the real world right now what research has shown is that unlike passively watching um, programs on television or movie uh, a lot of times based on how that violence was presented it can actually work well where it it sort of generates emotions in the mind of the person that makes them look down upon this violence and, and sort of help them realize that the pain that that violence inflicts on others right so when presented correctly even these violent scenes can help the person become more let's say sensitive to other people's needs and therefore um, be, be more useful to the society that said there's a lot of research which has actually shown that with more impressionable minds especially between ages 8 to 14 right this is when a lot of body chemistry is changing i, I think um, what's also happened is that the adolescence is kicking in earlier um, across the, the world with better nutrition with all kinds of hormones in the food chain etc kids are getting uh, uh, you know, growing faster and they're starting to experience uh, adolescence much sooner than let's say the previous generation. And so even some of that, that emotional and mental maturity is starting to happen. So, so therefore that eight to 14 is a critical stage and research has shown that unlike watching violence, which may sometimes actually may not hurt that much, may in fact um, be beneficial to some extent in gen generating awareness and sympathy for the victim, when you start to role play in those violent roles, when you start to use a gun or use a sword to, to sort of, you know, kill the opponent, some of it, if done too much at a young age and impressionable minds can almost act like a muscle memory where it sort of becomes normal for you to pick a weapon. Now, I'm not suggesting that someone who's playing those games would go out and start shooting people. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of common sense. People, most uh, kids won't do that. But it does start to, in the, the way the mind works, starts to maybe a little bit legitimize some of that. And, and some kids uh, who are maybe particularly vulnerable, maybe because of family circumstances, because of their emotional status, they start to feel that this is reality. And that it's perfectly normal to, to, to get physical when you are in disagreement with someone, right? So it sort of makes things normal, which in a physical world would not be normal. So to that extent, there is a small percentage of the population, uh, especially young minds, which can actually become violent later in their lives, partially influenced by what they experienced in the gaming world. And so one has to be careful. That said, I would not probably blow it out of proportions. Uh, for a large part of the community, large part of teenagers, students who play these games routinely, there is very little, if any, risk that they're going to go out and start killing people. That's not going to happen. So, so one has to sort of take it with a balanced perspective. But clearly, the, 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 the disconnection from the physical world, uh, the, some of these people or kids start to make a world of their own. In fact, they start to get into a sort of a denial mode and have sort of a creation of their own around the and anything that doesn't match that mental model that they've created they would fairly quickly reject it and sometimes that leads to even for example having very little or no quality relationship with their own family because their family doesn't identify with the, the system that they've created around themselves right so it can be a big problem and there are documented cases case studies on how you know um, a lot of kids face that problem Definitely. There have been so many cases which we can relate to. Okay. Right. So any of the students, if you would have any queries, you're free to write in the chat box. And if you want to just, we can uh, promote you as panelist and you can come and talk to sir. Okay. So moving further, sir, I would also like to ask if people uh, see this, uh, all this online uh, addiction, as a you know runaway or a coping mechanism uh, for uh, you know relieving their stress or maybe their loneliness or depression so just they try to run away from that reality and you know switch more and more towards uh, online gaming or any any kind of online activity 
Yeah. So I think there are different drivers uh, for different people. Uh, uh, if you if you uh, look at why uh, increasingly the the students and and sort of the young generation go online, right, for the gaming purpose. Of course, as you pointed out towards the introduction of this program, uh, the the Corona epidemic had its own um, uh, you know implication because you know there, there was very little scope for one to go out so you were sort of forced to to do this but even without that the trend was very clear and there are as i said multiple different drivers so of course there's a big element of peer pressure uh, uh, kids who were uh, quite happy to go out and play in the parks or do some physical activity or you know just go and have a good time with the friends physically uh, once they realize that their peers all of them are online or they have gadgets and they're playing these fancy games, whether online, offline, right? Um, chances are, and, and as parent, I've seen that, um, you know, where my kid would want every single gaming console that was there, right? They were not going to get satisfied with one because, hey, my friend has also the Xbox and also the Sony and, you know, they, they would have everything. And so therefore I want three consoles as well, right? I want, um, uh, everything and, and so that peer pressure initially tends to uh, to uh, initiate the the a lot of people or a lot of kids uh, a lot of students into the gaming world right they usually learn it from one of their peers that's how it starts um, of course as they start to get deep into it uh, as I explained earlier the whole thinking behind the creators of these games is to hook to appeal to the dopamine chemistry and to make it as addictive as possible. And therefore, of course, it, it sort of appeals, it becomes pleasurable and you start to lose sense of time and resources you're spending on it. Uh, in a group gaming, uh, there's also the ability to interact and compete and cooperate with your friends. So sort of it gives you a second high, the oxytocin chemistry, as I explained earlier, where you're working together with your buddies and accomplishing something together. So a lot of people do it plainly because of that. But then, as you said, there's also an element of escapism, right? Where you are able to go in your own world and do things which you wouldn't in the physical world. You are able to go and bash up a big guy. You are able to kill and maim. You are able to, you know, do all kinds of things uh, which you would never think of doing. Also, uh, students with low esteem, with with lower confidence, they feel. Uh, emancipated because you know they can be as big a bully as the other guy on that forum or they can choose to quickly move from one forum to the other and and try and seek some instant gratification right so it sort of changes the whole psyche of the student right uh, where unlike in the physical world you would have to work hard you have to improve your strength your stamina to, to accomplish something in sports here with the click of a few buttons with some practice and by choosing the right group and the right game, which is uh, suitable for your responsiveness, your reflexes, you become a winner or else you move on to another one, right? So, so this, this sort of leads to a belief that uh, things can be worked out quickly and that results can be had without necessarily a lot of hard work, which in the long run is probably not a very healthy belief to have. So, of course, there, there, there is this element of escapism and instant gratification that online gaming promotes. Very true. Very true, sir. So, uh, yeah, Varsala, ma'am, any, any query from your student side? Maybe you've seen a case which you want to discuss in your college? Uh, something, sir. Uh, there are students who, you know, uh, they don't perform very well in their, you know, those regular tests and all of those things and you know as teachers we tend to you know scold them why haven't you scored well you performed so well in your last test and this time you, you you've gone down so uh, the other students they keep telling us uh, you know initially they were uh, there was this game which was blocked recently i'm forgetting the name of that game so all of them were, you know, playing for the entire nights and their studies getting hampered. So, you know, we really tried as teachers that, you know, they should come out of that state of not playing uh, online games the entire night and also spending some time on their studies. But it has been so futile, this exercise, 
that you know unless that game was uh, blocked by the government till that time we had suffered literally but you know students we couldn't pull out our students from those addictions so sir is there anything i mean students don't have that kind of will power you know that they uh, you know uh, drag themselves out anything that we can do to you know uplift them from that you know that state yeah uh, no i can uh, i can very well understand where you're coming from ma'am um, but i would also say i wouldn't probably generalize uh, all of us have been students so uh, right. i wouldn't probably um, i wouldn't like to uh, believe that students don't have willpower uh, <laughs> uh, maybe some don't but that's like any other part of the society right uh, to some extent um um okay there's this probably a message from someone uh, i don't know if there's a question uh, so maybe someone's looking at it anyway um so i would say as i said earlier at the end of the day this is like any other pleasurable thing uh, just that it's a little little more tricky because it's much more easier to access uh, because it's available on the same gadget same forum which is also used for knowledge sharing for um, uh, for education i mean no parent today um, would deny their kid um, an ipad or a laptop or a phone or an internet connection because hey they need it for their education right so and unfortunately that quality that that characteristic of the medium uh, is what also makes it particularly easy for the the gaming um, producers to exploit because you, they know that the media will not be denied and therefore uh, the more addictive they can make some of these games and anyway reach is not the problem um, you know people will come flocking uh, students would come flocking um but at the end of the day one has to question as i said earlier uh, the parents in canada who sued this company after one year uh, for their kid having spent 2000 hours uh, was it addiction or was it lack of parenting okay so somewhere i think uh, the parents have to be questioned and of course the audience that we have today are all college students and therefore i would expect some level of maturity and responsibility from them and therefore rather than blaming either the the gaming industry or even the parents i would say to these students uh, have fun but somewhere at this age you are young adults and and i think every student owes it to themselves for their future to have that little trade off as i explained earlier which is list down all the the the, the most important things in your life that you want to accomplish or you think you need right what's important to you and then say of all the time you're spending on gaming is every minute of it justified and what cost that's taking from those important things if you feel that you're able to accomplish everything that you have on that important list and still play 5 hours of game well go ahead and do it i'll be the first person to say why not if however you're honest to yourself and realize that you are taking a toll on those important things your your time with your parents right maybe your brother your friends your time on academics right which is probably going to help you get a decent grade which is going to eventually help you get maybe a good job or maybe help you start up if if the 5 hours you're spending on game is coming in in the way of that dream then i think you as a young adult have to really think because you know we can always put all kinds of blockades on internet access on sites and games but how long can you do that how long can you continue to control the life and the destiny of a uh, destiny of an adult right you you can't sort of do that in perpetuity so to some extent one can think of governments doing bans of these games or colleges putting restrictions on what sites to reach or parents taking away the phone but i would probably put that question back on the student's plate and say look at the end of the day you have to learn that skill of balancing your priorities because otherwise life is not going to be easy students have to learn that so so i i would probably take that approach i mean at least that's the approach i'd like to take with my kids uh, uh, so far it's it's sort of working out well not every day is pleasant of course there are these back and forth discussions and i try and show them the implication of what they're doing uh, i do measure i do monitor what they're doing i don't want them to think that you know whatever they're doing would not be detected or discovered but at the same time i don't restrict i don't control their time i i let them 
decide because you know how long can you do as a parent or as a teacher control what they're doing right so therefore i think inculcating that sense of self control is is a very important part just sort of coming down on them and controlling everything maybe you'll accomplish a short term a goal but i think giving them a life skill of controlling and prioritizing their own activities is a, is a much better accomplishment thank you thank you sir and you know just just to add to it uh, i mean uh, maybe the question is a little out of context but you know uh, i have uh, a similar observation in uh, uh, the slightly older group of people you know people who have uh, crossed their uh, you know this uh, retirement uh, mark and you know after they retire from their jobs and i see people of that age group as well you know uh, so much addicted to their phones all the time either on games or some social media and you know not not taking their health very seriously not going for their walks which is you know actually very important for people of those age so you know uh, because i i uh, you know struggle with my parents and my in laws so you know how to how to motivate people of that lot to you know you know to you know come out of that phase and you know snap out of it for some time and you know just go out yeah actually i also see another question uh, uh from yes, doctor sir, from Nav dr navneet sharma yeah. so he was also asking the same question so is there always a query from parent side how to stop giving addiction of their own is there any remedial measure right so i i think what watsla asked is a sort of a broader question not just for the the, the sort of the kids but maybe even for the the elderly right and um, so i would say maybe it's easier to address for the kids first uh, i truly believe that kids don't learn as much from what you tell them they learn more from what they see you doing so so if you don't have the time and the patience to spend with them and you're always busy with your work and your social media and you know you, you could be busy for legitimate reasons but i'm saying if you don't have the time and the patience to spend with them then to expect them to spare their time to spend with you is probably unreal you can keep telling them that family is very important but they they see you spending most of your time on on your profession and your socializing then they are not going to learn that skill either so to me i think we as parents we as teachers we as mentors need to walk the talk we need to show by example what we mean when we say something and usually i've seen if you if you rather than saying do what you you mean usually kids would follow the cue okay so for example i'm not saying that you leave it entirely up to the kids to voluntarily follow what you're showing them but then facilitate that right so you have to demonstrate by leadership but then also as i said if you see that there is a continuous misuse of some of it is let's say on unsafe sites or unsafe games you as parent should intervene right uh, and basically say there are certain things i'll accept and certain things i'm not going to accept and if if things don't change then you intervene you if required take away the gadget you you sort of take away that the the internet or you use technology is very easy these days to sort of control what can be accessed what cannot be accessed there are a lot of good software to do that so you could control what can be accessed from a device or from a connection etc can be done easily but the point is these are all short term measures right this is i i almost sort of like to give this example of as you plant a young sapling on the road you want to protect it and you protect it by making a little let's say sort of a grid around it right a circular mesh around it to protect the sapling as it grows right and it's very important because if you if you let the plant grow on its own without that protection of the uh, the the mesh around it chances are either it would go awry it would uh, start to grow uh, uh, in an in sort of inclined fashion or maybe someone steps on it right if if it keeps growing in a particular direction then over a period of time as it becomes heavier it's going to fall down on its own weight and get destroyed or someone will step on it or an animal will come and you know eat it etc so you need to protect while the sapling is weak but as the sapling grows straight and becomes a strong solid tree right now the mesh is not a friend it's an enemy it's preventing the tree from growing further it's it's stalling the growth 
So at some point you have to let the mesh go because now you know the plant has become a tree and it needs to grow further on its own. And that fine balance of when to have that mesh and when to take it away is always a challenge as a parent, as a teacher. I think there's a fine balance to be had. Doing too much of mesh or too little of mesh, both are problems in my mind. And so therefore there's no fixed formula. It's, it's sort of a fine balance to be had. Parents who ask how to stop gaming addiction of their ward, well, uh, to begin with, I would say, well, as parents, you, you know better than, you know, me as a mentor or you as a teacher, because, um, you know, you have that bond that none of us will ever have with your child and, and use that bond, spend time with them, explain to them your concerns, right? So for, to your question, uh, specifically, um, with elderly, I feel the same thing. I mean, you can tell them, you can coax them, but usually what I've seen is what they really look for is, is, is how much time you're personally willing to spend with them. Okay. And if you are able to spend the time with them and you tell them, look, why don't we go out for a walk together? I think chances are they'll do that. Some, I mean, it's not, it's not a general solution. It may work for some may not, but I'm saying rather than uh, telling them, why don't you go out for a walk being less effective? Telling them, I want to go with a, uh, on a walk with you is likely to be more effective. What they really, you know, really want at that time is your company, your time. And if you can do that, they listen to you more. That's sort of my general experience. And actually that's true for the kids as well, right? As parents, as mentors and teachers, if we can walk with them and show them the path by walking with them rather than theoretically explaining them what the path is, by showing them that we are experiencing the same problems by being a little vulnerable sometimes and sort of admitting to that, hey, all of us have seen that. We've been, I mean, I can tell you from my personal experience something that my kids know. Uh, um, in my 10th class boards, right, um, a day before my mathematics, um, I was so addicted to a game that instead of preparing, I was in sitting, I and mean, we didn't have these internet games then. I was actually uh, playing a game called Commando, okay, in a video uh, game shop. And my mom had to send a friend to get me to remind me, look, there's a board examination tomorrow. So I'm saying all of us have been students. We understand that. And I think sometimes sharing these experiences with our kids helps because they understand that we are not preaching here. We, we've gone through the same phase. We've overcome that. And so can they. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think, I think I've got my answers and I need to walk with them rather <laughs> telling them to walk. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Actually, we have to reconnect actually to disconnect them from this. Yes. So reconnection, absolutely. I believe, is very, very important as uh, very beautifully explained that we have to actually set examples before our children and maybe we can also share our own examples with them. So that will really help them to come out of what the situation they've landed themselves into. That's right. Okay. So, Vatsala ma'am, any other question? I cannot uh, see any questions in the chat box. Uh, I believe uh, uh, there are no more questions, ma'am. So, I think uh, uh, Sir has very beautifully explained so many things that I don't think there's any, you know, any scope of any uh, lacuna here. So, with that, I think uh, I think it's time that we wind this session. And thank you so much, Raman sir and Deepa ma'am. And it has been a pleasure having you with us today. And we really, really hope that you, you know, spare your time sometime again in future and, you know, just be with us again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Well, thank you. It's, it's thank my you. pleasure. And thank you for facilitating this. Uh, you all have a great day. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.